Hi, I'm Joshua. I'm Mike. And I'm Daniel. And the 2022 January What's Needs starts right now. now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. Additional support is provided by Wathers Trains, everything you need to build a great model railroad. Check out their website at wathers.com. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for January 2022. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we do have a good show in that John Fowler walks us through from start to finish everything about printing with 3D printers these days. That's all the rage. I've got two models sitting here that we got from GNL Robotics, USA.com. Greg Summerland had shared with us these machines uh, that he actually sold to James Regeer. And James has been using them an awful lot as his house is being uh, rebuilt. So he's left them here in the studio. Recently, he's printed eight O-scale Clydesdales in this device. This is the Anticubic Photon Model X, which is one of the largest print beds available to us hobbyists, whereas he was able to print eight Clydesdales at the same time on this machine. So it's got a very large print bed for 3D printers. And this, in fact, is a resin printer. There are two types presently. There are resin printers and there are filament printers. The filament printers are the ones that have like the weed eater type line. Similar to what we showed on the December 2015 What's Neat with the Dremel 3D Ideal Builder print machine, which was all new technology back then. And that machine back then was at $999 available at the Home Depot. These machines have truly come down in price since that. Next to it, I've got the wash station, the anti-cubic wash station. And what that does is it washes the models after they're printed in alcohol which cleans off the excess sticky resin that may be on the model after it's printed with the uh, resins in this machine right here. And then it also has UV lights. So the model is spun around on a flat turntable as the UV lights further cure the model into complete hardness. And John Fowler walks us through the entire process, sharing with us his print farm, I would call it, where he has multiple types of machines, including these set up. And he shares with us how he builds O-scale tunnel portholes from start to finish. And he's very particular in that he wears a lab coat, gloves, respirator, and vents the fumes out of his studio. So he's very cautious with regards to that. So it's a very good video to watch and learn all the techniques and the safety precautions that he likes to go through. Also in this video, Denny Yelzma shares with us his wonderful railroad club down in Jacksonville, Florida. It's called the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Model Railroad Museum Club. And it's absolutely amazing in that this is a double deck layout. It's designed for operation. They do use a timetable, a schedule, a fast clock, and they're very strict about how they run their trains on this layout, which further enhances the hobby for so many people. Also, I'd like to make sure that you check out the What's Neat This Week video podcast that we record every Saturday night bringing you updated on all the new products in the hobby every week and including special guests, modelers just like you that have great layouts and great talents to share with all of us. It's a fun show with our podcast crew. And again, you can check it out on YouTube, What's Neat This Week in Model Railroading. And with that, let's continue on with the rest of this January 2022 What's Neat. Hello, this is Michael Gross and you're watching What's Neat with Ken Patterson. Hey everybody, John Fowler. In this video, you'll see how I set up multiple print jobs and all the post-processing necessary to produce the parts for these great looking tunnel portals. This particular order was produced for a gentleman in Southern California. He requested also that I paint and weather them. Of course, the first step is always PPE. I use gloves and a respirator. I also wear this lab coat to keep the resin off my clothes, and this stuff will get on everything if you're not careful. 
Before I open a bottle of resin, or take a cover off of a resin machine, I turn on the exhaust fan. This removes resin fumes from the room. This is a one quarter horsepower air mover that I mounted in the window. I show how to build the mount in a future video. On this day, I had a full bottle of used resin. Used resin may contain small bits of cured or half cured resin and needs to be filtered before it can be used again. Used resin accumulates because after a job is done printing, I store any leftover resin in this one liter bottle. This allows me to conserve filters by filtering a whole liter at a time. Here you see the equipment and supplies used for filtering. A funnel, a filter, a lot of paper towels, and a container for discarded paper towels. These are the same filters I use to filter paint when I mix paint for airbrushing. These filters were purchased from Amazon. I choose the smallest mesh available. The funnel is placed in an empty one liter bottle and the filter is placed in the funnel. Resin is poured slowly into the filter at the rate at which it drains. When all the resin is filtered, the equipment is wiped clean. Cleanup after every step is an important aspect of resin management. Now that I have clean resin, it's time to check the resin tanks. On this day, the tanks were free of liquid resin, but still needed a final cleaning with glass cleaner. A plastic container lined with a soft cloth is used to support the tank while it's being cleaned. The cloth protects the bottom of the tank, called the FEP, or FEP, from being damaged. FEP is a transparent, low friction membrane that is stretched across the bottom of the tank frame like a drum head, and is susceptible to damage. Spray away glass cleaner is used for the final step in cleaning the FEP. This can was purchased at Walmart. Paper towels and tissues will scratch the FEP, so a piece of cotton fabric is used to wipe the FEP. Holding the tank up to the light allows me to see any remaining residue and to check for any little pieces of cured resin that need to be removed. Cured resin left in the tank can damage the FEP and even the LCD on the printer if a job is run without removing it. The hardened pieces can be stubborn and difficult to remove. In this case, a piece of low-tack magic transparent tape was used to pull it up. On this job, in addition to the Mono X, I'll be using two smaller Sonic Minis. The tank cleaning process is the same for these machines. It's time to install the clean tanks on the printers. The tanks are held in place with finger tightened bolts or screws torqued until they're just snug. At this point the build plates are also tightened, wiped down, and checked for any cured resin still attached from the last print job. While the cover is still off, the resin is poured into the tank. I shake the resin to ensure complete mixing. Air bubbles introduced by shaking will rise to the surface of the liquid 
if left to sit for 15 to 30 minutes. At that point, the bubbles can be soaked up with a paper towel or moved to the edge with a scraper. Each machine has its own flash drive. The print files are copied from a computer onto the drives and the drives are plugged into the printers. The printers access the drives for the duration of the print. The prints are started by navigating via a touch screen on the face of the printer to the desired file on the flash drive selecting the file and pressing the start button. Here's a time-lapse clip of the print job. It ran for over nine hours overnight and was ready for washing in the morning. When the prints are finished, the screen displays the time it took to print. A record of hours of use are kept for each machine in a production log. Keeping records also aids in troubleshooting failed prints. At some point in the future, I'll be able to report how many hours these LCDs really last. The freshly printed parts are still covered in liquid resin. The resin will be washed off in a bath of isopropyl alcohol. Handling the parts in this state can be a challenge as they are very slippery and difficult to grip. It is also possible at this stage to mar the surface, so care in handling is required. The build plates are removed in preparation for deplating. Liquid resin will flow off the build plates and parts so they are immediately placed into a container. If the parts were small, the excess resin could be drained back into the resin tank. A putty knife with a sharpened edge is used to deplate the parts. Using a prying motion to pry the parts off often results in a broken part, so the knife is kept as flat as possible in an effort to slide it underneath the model. 
A consistent light to moderate force toward the plate and the part yields the best results. It may require up to a few minutes of this constant force, so patience is required. Parts with a large footprint generally have greater adhesion and are more difficult to deplate. Build plate adhesion can be affected by values set in the slicing software and by the texture of the build plate. The balance between adhesion and ease of removal is determined during the initial runs on each machine or any time a different type of resin is used. When washing the parts, I wear a face shield to protect my eyes from splashing alcohol. Models covered in slippery resin are easily dropped, and very often, it's into the alcohol. I also keep the respirator on because even though it's mostly diluted, resin dissolved in alcohol still gives off irritating fumes. These plastic coffee containers have airtight lids and are good for storing alcohol and are large enough for most of the models I print. Smaller plastic salsa containers are used to make this inner strainer. About 10 small holes are drilled into the bottom rim to allow the alcohol to drain out. These are used to hold small parts. The models are put through two baths. The first bath is 90% isopropyl alcohol. The second is 70% alcohol and is only used as a rinse. Parts are left in the 90% bath for 20 minutes. After being removed, a soft brush is used to brush away the diluted resin. Then the parts are brushed and rinsed in 70% IPA. After the rinse, they're left in a box lined with paper towels to dry overnight. It's good practice to let them dry for as long as 24 hours so that any alcohol that has penetrated into the model is evaporated. After they're dry, the parts are placed out in sunlight to cure. On this day, the UV index was 9 according to the local weather report, so the parts were left for about 10 minutes and then turned over. After another 10 minutes, the parts are taken inside and left to cool to room temperature. The models are washed in laundry detergent and water, rinsed in clean water, and left to dry.
When dry, the models are ready to assemble, prime, paint, and weather. I'm Denny Yelswam. Many of you know me from Yelswam Graphics, the guy that makes all the railroad and embroidery clothing. And you've seen me at a thousand train shows all over the United States. And some of you know me from the What's Neat. I'm a special, I will be a special guest on uh, What's Neat this week with Ken Patterson. But today you're gonna see me in a little bit different light than you normally see me. I'm a member of a model railroad club here in Jacksonville, Florida. And it's a really special treat that we have for you today because this club is one of the finest railroad clubs in the Southeast United States. It's extremely accurate and I think you'll really enjoy it. And I'm a member of this club and every Friday I get the pleasure of coming and running trains. You know, when Ken Patterson ends his show, he always says, let's go run some trains. So just like Ken Patterson, I'm gonna say, Let's go run some trains at the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum Club layout. We're here inside the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum Club layout. I want to tell you a little bit about this layout. It's extremely unique. It's in a building that's 25 by 35. It's actually three levels. We have two helixes. Uh, we use code 100 for the main line. We use code 83 for some of the sightings and code 70 for some of the yards. We have hand throws and then we also have electronic throw switches. Uh, all the track is controlled by signal and we are depicting in this layout the Jacksonville, Florida area, a 50 mile radius of Jacksonville. And it's from Jessup, Georgia, all the way south to St. Augustine, and all the way west to Baldwin, Florida, about a 50 mile radius of Jacksonville. Jacksonville, 90% of the trains that come into the state of Florida go through the city of Jacksonville. And what this museum is doing is depicting the era from 1939 to 1974. And we run in eras and every Friday we have a running session and it's really neat to come here and have a running session because uh, we walk in just like a regular train crew would walk into the crew quarters and we get our orders and we're assigned a train and we start operating. Right now the club is operating in the year of 1946 and uh, we run passengers and freight. And so uh, most of the buildings are hand uh, built from, uh, from kits and some were scratch built. Uh, we have some very talented members here. The club has around 15 to 18 paying members that varies. And on an operating uh, day like today, we typically will have around five to six people operating because we normally run four to six scheduled passenger and freight trains a day. So let's go watch some of the trains move around this layout. We're going to first start at the Jacksonville Terminal and that's what this club is named, the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum Club layout. And <coughs> Jacksonville had a beautiful train station and we have this 
depicted and you'll see different sites around this layout that are actually there everything is pretty accurate because we have photographs and what as I said before I think this is one of the finest layouts that you'll find in the southeast United States we're going to start this tour of the museum layout right here at the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad and we have a model here of the Jacksonville Terminal. This terminal was built around 1918 or started in 17 and 18 and this what you see here is the Jacksonville train station and where all the trains are made up and so from here we go out to the west which We'll end up in Baldwin, Florida, and then to the south we cross the St. John's River and we go to Bowden Yard in the Florida East Coast. Okay. What we have here is a model of the Trout River Bridge. This was on the main line of the seaboard in North Jacksonville. This is uh, the picks of the Trout River. One of our members, Bill Hardy, made this scratch builder. It's absolutely gorgeous, and this bridge is all uh, controlled by signals. What we have here is West Jacksonville Shop and Yard. We have a operating uh, table that moves back and forth. But this here depicts the seaboard's operation in West Jacksonville. What we have here is Simpson Yard. Simpson Yard was the termination point for the Southern Railroad to Jacksonville, Florida. This is where they changed the uh, engine facilities and refueling and all the passenger trains and freight trains that would be destined for Jacksonville, Florida would go to Simpson Yard for the Southern Railroad. What we have here is the scene that depicts the Florida-Georgia border where the Atlantic coastline crossed the St. Mary's River. This scene is so unique. I get really excited about this scene because it, when you look at the detail that is around the river, the bridge, the whole scene is just outstanding. Now an interesting story about this bridge, it's kind of dear to my heart, is that this bridge was in my house in a pile of junk and if you saw this bridge it, you wanted to throw it away and I was talking to Bill Hardy and he says hey we could use this bridge at the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum layout and I said we'll go for it and I gave him the bridge and just look what this gorgeous scene looks like now we're here at Folkston Georgia this is a very interesting place on the Atlantic coastline it was a place where the tracks diverted one going to the north and the other one to the northwest to Waycross, Georgia. And there was a lot of trains that went through Fort Houston, Georgia. And today there's a nice viewing platform there. And what we're going to see here in just a second here is the train in 1946, the South Wind. It originated in Chicago and it was pulled by the Atlantic Coast Line steam engine. This train is exactly how it was. One of the things that we pride ourselves here at the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum is that each train is exact how it was when it ran in that particular era. The cars, uh, we have a um, member that is a scratch model builder and boy, we make sure that everything is exact. This is Folkston, Georgia. What we have here is Moncrief Yard. This was the major yard in Jacksonville, Florida for the Atlantic coastline. And running parallel to the uh, Moncrief, the southern was over to the uh, west. But a lot of activity happened in Moncrief Yard. And what you see here is exactly how Moncrief Yard looked on the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad. You have to kind of forgive me sometimes for getting excited. 
because I get excited about a, a lot of the little detail about this model railroad. What we have here is the train station at South Jacksonville. Very few people actually know that there was a train station at South Jacksonville on the Florida East Coast. At one time, at this section, it went out to the beaches and then in the going south it went to Bowden Yard. But the detail that we have on this layout of this small little station is depicted on this railroad. What we have here is Bowden Yard. This is the northern terminus of the Florida East Coast Railroad. And for those of you who don't know anything about the Florida East Coast Railroad, it was founded by Henry Flagler, John D. Rockefeller's business partner. And he came to Florida and he built the Florida East Coast Railroad that ran from Jacksonville to Miami, Florida, 358 miles. And what we have depicted here is the Northern Terminus Yard, their home yard, their big one, and it's called Bowden Yard. And the president of our railroad club here is Rodney Butcher. He spent 44 years as an engineer running out of this yard here, Bowden Yard, here in Jacksonville, Florida. And another footnote about Bowden Yard, which is extremely interesting, and why this club is so accurate on its history and depicting everything. When we showed you a picture of South Jacksonville, right there was the original Florida East Coast Yard. But in the real estate boom and the big boom in the 1920s, Jacksonville and the railroad grew so much that they had to move it seven miles south and they created Bowden Yard. And they made a two double main line headed south and that's how Bowden Yard was created. We're in St. Augustine, Florida. As you can see here, the scene here, we have the train station, we have the Howard Johnson, and we actually have Miller's shop. The Howard Johnson was not built until the 50s, and this train station here wasn't built until the 1950s. And it was a really futuristic train station at that particular time. you got to remember that the Florida East Coast was a seasonal railroad. Heavy traffic in the wintertime and very slow in the summertime. It was mainly passionate trains, perishable such as uh, fruits and vegetables and orange juice naturally. And when the season came in, that's when the railroad really got busy. But the main part of their business was seasonal tourist northerners coming down to sunny Florida. They came from the New York area and the Chicago area. And actually, they actually had more trains coming out of the Midwest than they did out of the Northeast. But this is St. Augustine, Florida. What we have here is Fernandina Beach. This is a branch line of the seaboard. And actually, Fernandina is very historic in rail history because it was the first railroad that ran from Fernandina to Uly to Cedar Key and the founder of that railroad was a guy named David Uly, and there's a town just north of Jacksonville called Uly. But this here is uh, Uly, Florida. It was basically uh, a paper mill uh, town. It was a mill town, and the seaboard brought in pulpwood, and we depict uh, the scene of Fernandina, and I think they did an outstanding job. We have downtown Fernandina. Uh, some of our members did just an outstanding job on the different buildings. Here is a typical train that went into Fernandina. It's an RS3 and uh, by the seaboard and heavy with pulpwood. And this, as you can see, is the uh, pulpwood uh, yard that they would bring in on the seaboard. This was a heavy, uh, active yard in its day. One of the greatest joys that I have is coming to the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum Club layout every Friday. Not only is this a museum, it is a working HO layout club. 
And when I walk in that door, I am just totally excited because the first place I go is this right here. And this is where I pick up my train order because on Friday is operational day and this is when I pick up my orders to run uh, the train that I'm assigned. Today, my train order is the Sun Queen and this is the train for the uh, Seaboard uh, airline and right here is all my orders and I have special orders just like on the real railroad and we operate on uh, schedule and I take my orders, I go to my train, I do all my testing before we take off, I get a hold of the dispatcher and then he tells me when I could leave the yard. But it all starts right here where we're assigned and this is kind of our crew headquarters right here. But it is such a joy to come and run a model train layout in a museum quality type of atmosphere and run trains the way they ran in the day that they were running. Okay, where we are now is at what we call F and J Yard. It's the north end of downtown Jacksonville, and it's the Fernandina Jacksonville Yard. Uh, the railroad, when it first started, went from Fernandina and Nassau to Jacksonville. And so what we have depicted here is the yard and the switching that took part in the everyday operation of the north end of F and J Yard. And this was served by the Seaboard uh, Airline Railroad and the Southern. And what we have here is uh, a lot of heavy industry. And I think the sceneries and what we have here is just outstanding. This club is basically known for running passenger trains, but we do have complete industry uh, set here. And one of the little uh, items that I really like is uh, the president of our club, Rodney Butcher, has his grandfather's general store that is located right over here and uh, in this section. And he has many fond memories that he tells the club about when he was a little boy watching trains and going to his grandfather's store. So once again, not only are we a model railroad club, but we are a museum. What you see here is the Talleyrand dock area. Uh, as time went along, they had to dredge the St. John's and they made the first municipal dock and the railroad served this particular area. What we have here is the roundhouse and engine facilities just west of the Jacksonville Terminal uh, Station. Uh, what you see here is the roundhouse. This was scratch built from photographs and blueprints by Jack Wagner, a longtime member of our club, uh, who was a, a semi-professional photographer, and scratch built this entire uh, roundhouse area. The turntable does work. Basically, we have a rule at our club that once the train engine car gets on, we don't want to touch it physically. And so we move and make all of our moves and switching all with the uh, uh, throttles of our DC seat. On behalf of Ken Patterson and the What's Neat Show, we want to thank the Jacksonville Terminal Railroad Museum for allowing us to come and film this outstanding layout. But before we go, I want you to meet some of the members that keep this railroad going. First of all, we have Greg, who is an outstanding modeler, and we have naturally the president, Rodney, who is 44 years a Florida East Coast Railroad engineer, retired, and he does keep us straight. And we have Mike who is a professional model builder, and that's what he does for a living. And then we have Richard, who is another outstanding member that makes a lot of models on the railroad that you've seen. So, once again, we hope our fans across the world enjoy this club layout. And so, from Jacksonville, Florida, let's all say goodbye. 
All of the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. Wathers Trains, supporting hobby retailers across the world since 1932. Check out their website and learn more at Wathers.com. Bachman Trains, now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at BachmanTrains.com. 